If you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 88. Psalm 88. That's the text we're going to be focusing on this morning. Before I start, though, it's good to be back home with you all. It's good to see everybody. It's been good to say hi. Uh, I can't do anything but smile when I look out and see you all again. It's, it's very good to be back. Um, before I get into anything, I have to say this. Um, I was talking to Paige before uh, services started. And I, she asked if I was nervous. And I said, yeah, I'm kind of nervous. And she said, what for? And I just, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty logical. I just said, I, don't, I just don't want to be just as bad as I used to be or just as, <laughs> just as inept. And, and she just said, honey, you can't be as bad as you were before you were. <laughs> I, had, I had to say that before I started. It was just, it was too good not to say, so. So thank you, Paige, for that encouragement. But um, the scripture reading that we read this, this morning, it was at this time in Philippians, Paul was in prison again. Uh, he was in prison for preaching Christ and doing what he did uh, often. And this was a time of, of great distress. This was a time of great struggle. For Paul, of course it would be. He's in prison. And yet, I find it very comforting and encouraging that he can say, pray. Don't be anxious about these things. He's the one in prison, and he's saying to these other fellow Christians, he's saying, don't, don't be anxious. Pray about these things. Pray through these things, and you can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I want to focus on prayer this morning. Just for a few minutes today, I want to focus on prayer uh, I did it wrong. Prayer in hopelessness. And that's what we see in Psalm 88, I believe. So we're going to go ahead and read through this entire psalm. It shouldn't take that long. Psalm 88. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah to the choir master, according to Mahaleth Lanith, a mascal of Heman the Ezrahite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the, do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Now, after we've read that whole thing, what do you kind of get from the psalm? It's, it's not a very happy psalm. It, the, the tone that we find is, is one of sorrow. Kind of a it's really kind of depressing at first glance. If you notice... Uh, in, 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 in the third book of Psalms, from Psalm 73 to Psalm 89, there's a, there's a common perspective of struggle and, and, and going and trying to find your way through that struggle and, and being one of depression, again, of sorrow. And especially in Psalm 73, Jerome did a sermon over Psalm 73 a couple years back, but the first half of the psalm, Asaph, who was one of the leaders in worship, Asaph is writing and he's saying, you know, the wicked are fat and sleek, and I'm living righteously, and I just, I'm not seeing the point. I don't understand why it seems that they are the ones that prosper, and I'm trying to live God, a godly life, 
and I am the one that's struggling. Now, toward, towards the second half of the psalm, we find where his hope ends up. And we, find, and, we, and we find where he finds that strength. Psalm 88 is very unique, I think, because if you notice, the psalm starts and it ends in darkness. The last word in the psalm, at least in the ESV, is darkness. And there really doesn't seem to be any high point, at least at first glance. But that's what I want to talk about this morning. I just want to, I want to just go through this text and make a few applications just for a few minutes. And then the lesson will be yours. The first thing that I think we find in this psalm is that the psalmist goes to God. He goes to God in prayer. He starts with God. Notice in verse Verses 1 and 2, he says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. He starts with God, and I find it comforting that even though throughout the whole psalm it's encompassed by darkness, by depression, by pain, he still starts with God. Even though we don't see any silver lining in the psalm, he's still starting with God, and I think that we can find some comfort in that. But... Also, I just want to make a tiny tangent. Honestly, where else could he go? In this time of, of darkness where there's nothing where he, where he can go, nowhere he can go, nothing he can do, where else can he go? Where else can we go? Because we've had days like this, haven't we? Where we can say everything just seems to be falling apart. Nothing seems to be going right. I can't do anything to fix what's going on. I am helpless. We, we've, we've had days like this where we just feel absolutely hopeless. Like everything is futile. Where everything looks bleak. So where else can we go? Beca oh, sorry. <laughs> Different PowerPoint. But where else can we go? Because sometimes those bad days turn into bad weeks. And it stays in that state, that state of darkness. In times like this, I think it's natural that we as human beings want to be heard. And that makes sense. A lot of times what we do is we go at the end of the week on Friday, we get on Facebook, we write a short book, and we post it. We want to be heard. We want some interaction from others, some support. But what we do, just like I said in the example of Facebook, we go to all the wrong places. And when we do, we end up more distraught than we were. If we had started off with God, we wouldn't have gotten to this point. But now, we've gone even deeper into the depression. Deeper into darkness. Deeper into sorrow. We go to everyone but God. And we must have the same mentality, I think, as we see in John chapter 6. You don't have to turn there. But in John chapter 6, Jesus says some offensive things. He says that I am the bread of life. And there was multitudes of people following him. And after he gives this kind of offensive sermon, the people leave. They abandon him because they don't like what he says. And he turns to his disciples. He says, will you leave also? And Peter just says in John 6, in, in verse 68, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? Even when there is nothing else to do, we still have God. We can start there. And we can stay there. And we can find comfort there. But I think along with this, in going to God, we need to give it all to Him. If you'll turn to 1 Samuel in chapter 1. When we go to God in prayer, we need to give it all to Him. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we meet a woman named Hannah who is barren. She doesn't have any children, and she desperately wants children. She wants just one child. And, and she's, we find her praying after everyone else is, is eating and drinking and, and being married. We find her praying in verse 9. And it says that Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Again, we see someone in distress going to God. 
In verse 11, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. I love that idea. When we go to God in prayer, we need to give it all to Him. I love that phrase, pouring out her soul. That's what we need to do when we are in distress and when we are crying and we see nothing else, we need to give it all to Him, even though we know, we understand that He already knows. In Isaiah chapter 37, we find, we find uh, Judah in a not-so-good state. They're being attacked by Assyria. In chapter 36, in verse 1, it says that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them, and they were not in a very... They were kind of in the hot seat at the moment. They were not in a good place. In verse 13, it says that the Rabshakeh stood, stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah so that everyone knew what he was saying. And he starts taunting them. And he starts saying some things that would make them doubt. Assyria was the top dog. Assyria was the, was the nation. If they were coming for you, you could not escape. There was no way out. There was no light at the end of the tunnel if Assyria was coming for you. So Hezekiah, in verse 14, when, when he receives the letter with the words of the rap Shaka on it, it says in verse 14 that he read it. Uh, well, he received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And we get into this deep personal prayer in verse 16 through 20. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God. You alone, of all the kingdoms of the, of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are Lord. Again, we see this deep personal prayer. And I love this, this scene of laying it out before the Lord. We know that God understands what's going on. We understand that He is omnipotent and He sees all. He knows all. He can read our hearts. But that's, that's not the point. Hezekiah still lays this letter out before the Lord. And that's how we need to do it. We need to pour out our souls. We need to give it all to God and trust Him. We see this trust in this prayer. And along with it, we see that Hezekiah's hope is inseparable from God. So we need to go to God, first of all, in prayer. But after that, we need to continue in prayer. If you'll turn to, uh, uh, back to Psalm 88. Psalm 88. I just want to recognize a few things. I want to notice how many times the, the writer says, I'm coming to you, God. How many times he repeats himself. In verses 1 and 2, we already read again, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. He says in verse 1 that I cry out day and night before you. That's pretty descriptive. That, we understand what that means, but he doesn't stop there. And at the end of verse 8, he says, I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? And then he doesn't stop there. He says something again. One more time in verse 13. But I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. This is a constant state for the psalmist. 
This is a continual thing for him. He keeps on going in prayer. He does not stop. Again, think about the time of his life at this point in Psalm 88. There is no point. There is no hope. And he keeps going every day, every night. And I th- it kind of makes me, it kind of reminds me of uh, Jacob in Genesis chapter 32. Uh, the psalmist is very persistent in his prayer to God. He doesn't stop. And in Genesis chapter 32, Jacob is coming back, he's coming back home, and he's worried about what Esau is going to do to him. And during the night, he's wrestling with someone. We find out that, he, that he's kind of wrestling with, uh, whether it be an angel or God, he's wrestling with someone all night. And, and he continues throughout the entire night. And finally, day breaks. And the man says, day has broken, let me go. But Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I, I love that story, first of all. But I also love the, the implication behind that. You know what? That, was when, that is the story when Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And you know what Israel means? He strives with God. And that is how we need to be in our prayer life. We need to be striving with God when we pray to Him. We need to be continually doing it every day, every night. And often we pray once and then we look for other things to op- occupy our minds. We think, okay, I'm done. I've gotten that out of the way. Now I need to find something to occupy my mind so I don't have to think about this problem. But why? We, 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 sometimes we forget that we're praying to the God of, that has created everything we see. We're praying to our Lord. Why are we trying to occupy our minds with anything other than Him? But before we, before we move on in that regard, I want to make just a quick side point in verse 13. I, like, I love this idea of when He says, Lord, I cry to You. In the morning, my prayer comes before You. I, I like that. You know, what do you do in the morning? A lot of us, we have to get up early because we've got to get going to work. We've got to get ready and we've got to get there. But, you know, when you get up in the morning, for whatever reason, if it's early, it's most likely very important. When we were in football at a- in Avon, every Friday in the offseason, every Friday we had 5 a.m. practices. That meant you're going to be up before 5. <laughs> you've got to be there by 5. And you've got to work out. That suggests, that implies importance. That suggests significance. And I love, I just love the fact that that's what the psalmist says. In the morning my prayer comes before you. That suggests that this is the first thing on his mind and this is important in his life. You know, the first thing that I do, and I'm not trying to get any brownie points or anything, but the first thing I do every morning is I text Paige. I text Paige good morning. I say, good morning, I miss you. Hope you have a good day. Now, I was wondering if I shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to anyway because now it's awkward. But uh, <laughs> when I don't, there tends to be a problem that day. <laughs> but honestly, that's the way it should be with us and God at least. When we don't pray to God, when we don't start our day off with God, that, that needs to be a problem because that is where I want to go. That is important to me. I want to share that interaction. I want to go to God in prayer, like the psalmist. Now that I've thoroughly embarrassed myself, let's continue to the previous point. Let's continue in the previous point. Why does the psalmist continue in prayer? Why is it that he keeps going? Why is it that he's so persistent? Well, I think it's because the psalmist wanted to constantly be with him because that's where he found comfort. That's where his comfort came from. That's where it originated. And when we are sad, again, we want to be surrounded by friends. We want to be surrounded by family. In great times of sorrow, that's what usually happens because we want that support. We want that comfort from them. We want them to be around us to help us get through those hard times. And again, that needs to be the same way with God as we see with the psalmist, I believe. This is how he copes with the darkness. This is how he gets through the helplessness, the hopelessness. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 22, Luke 22 and verse 44, this is my, one of my favorite verses in, in the scriptures. Luke 22, we, we know this scene, we've read it several times. Jesus 
is on the Mount of Olives and he's praying, and this is before his crucifixion. And, and we find that, that, there are, that there's anxiety involved and, and, and that he's with his disciples and he tells them to pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdraws from them. And he starts praying. He says in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Notice what it says in verse 44. Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In this verse, we see a lot going on. We see Jesus, the Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We see the Christ sweating like drops of blood. And it says at the very beginning of verse 44, being in an agony, what? Cause and effect. Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Again, I don't know why we try to occupy our minds with anything else. Why we ever start with anything else other than God. Because that is the only person, that is the only way that we can receive comfort in this world of darkness. That is the only way that we can find hope. Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And if we see it in Christ, if we see it in our Lord, then I think that we probably need to imitate that and take that to heart a little bit more. He didn't want to go anywhere else other than the Father because that's where his comfort and his hope and his help and his assurance came from. But the final point, once we've gone to God and once we've continued in prayer, what does that mean for us? Well, we're praying in hope now. Even in this darkness, even though there is hopelessness around us, we are able to pray in hope because, again, that's, where God, that's what God is. He is our hope. He is our salvation. He is that light at the end of the tunnel. If you, uh, notice, how many t- or if you notice the psalmist in Psalm 88, back in Psalm 88, We see just what he is seeing. We don't see it from any other perspective or any other angle. We just see the moment that he is in at that time. And it reminds me a lot of Job. Job was a righteous man. Job was a godly man. And yet he was suffering. He was the one that had to go through all this pain and all of this loss the sorrow of this world, losing everything and everyone close to him. And he's just continually praying to God and and just asking, why? And haven't we been there before? God, I get it. I understand. None are righteous. I am not righteous. That I am helpless. That I need you. I get it. I'm there. Why is this happening to me? I understand. But just like Job, We're only seeing it from our perspective. And we're not seeing it from God's eyes. We're not seeing it from a different angle. In hindsight, we know know exactly what happened, that God was with Job every step of the way. We know that God was with him. As as you read uh, in, in God's answer to Job by the end of the book, we also find uh, that Job never actually realizes why he went through what he did. The, the book ends, and there's no indication that God told Job why he was suffering or what happened. But we do know that there's a lesson to be learned. There's a few lessons to be learned. One being that even in suffering, even in seemingly hopelessness, we still have hope in God. And I think that that is even more so uh, apparent in Lamentation. If you'll turn to Lamentation very quickly. Lamentations chapter 3. At this time, this was when God's judgment had come. There was no escaping it. Jerusalem was being destroyed. And the temple was ransacked. The glory of God had been ransacked. And Jeremiah is seeing all of this. And there is no way out. And that makes sense because it's God's judgment finally coming to pass. There is no escape. And Jeremiah sees this to the very bitter end. 
And, and I think that the language at, at the beginning of chapter 3 in Lamentations mimics that of Psalm 88. In verse 1 he says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven me and brought me into darkness without any light. In verse 6, uh, or at the end of verse 5, uh, he says, He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. And then skipping down to verse 17. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Just really quickly stopping there. I don't want to get into a tangent, but we have been there before. Where we're so wrapped up in what's going on around us. I forget what happiness is. But going on in verse 18. So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it, and it is bowed down within me. Again, we've been here before. We see Jeremiah. It's, I really think that there's a lot to, that can be related to Psalm 88. He says, I'm, I've been brought into darkness without any light. Again, there is no silver lining. But we get to verse 21. After he says all this, he kind of flips the switch. In verse 21 he says, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Even in hopelessness, we still have hope. Even in Psalm 88, where there seems to be no silver lining, the silver lining is God. That is the hope. That is the light at the end of the tunnel. The fact that we can start with God, the fact that we can continue with God and strive with Him in prayer. Even in hopelessness, even in darkness, we can still have light because He is light. Because He is that hope. So please close your Bibles and turn to the song that was selected. I think that in Psalm 88, I believe that we can find that a man who turns to the only hope he has in Psalm 88, a man that is surrounded in darkness, a man who is encompassed by sorrow and pain and anguish, even in that state, he still has hope. And we can continue in that hope. And we can reside in that hope, even in times of disparity. Even though we live in a world of darkness. But that's only in Him. If you are not a Christian, if you are not a child of God, you do not have that hope. And you will not have that comfort unless you are baptized into Jesus Christ, baptized into His death, death so that you can be renewed to, be, to, re, to arise and walk in newness of life in His resurrection. If you are a Christian, but you've stumbled, you've lost your way, and you probably have gone through a couple of bad days just like this in Psalm 88, you can come back to God. You can still have that hope, and you can reside in that comfort. If you're all subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.